Um, this is the futures of entertainment destinations. So this presentation is going to build on crisis and disaster management literature by examining possible post-COVID strategies for select North American entertainment destinations whose vitality depends on a thriving entertainment scene. I think the last poll was kind of relevant to this, so I'm excited to hear about it. So this is going to be drawing from industry experts' responses to full four alternative images of the future. And we're going to discuss how existing strategies appear limited in this particular instance and highlight practical implications for destinations. Our speaker today is Louis Etienne Dubois. Um, he's the Associate Professor of Creative Industries Management at Ryerson University's School of Creative Industries. He's an Associate Researcher at Mines Paris Tech's Center for Scientific Management. He's the director of the Future of Live Entertainment Lab, a research partner between Ryerson University's Faculty of Communication and Design and the Cirque du Soleil Entertainment Group. So on that note, I am going to invite Louis to turn on his camera and he will be able to get the presentation started. Hi, Louis. Oh, you're still muted. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I got to my button before you said it. Uh, all right, okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Megan. Love the musical break. Although I kind of got a little bit nervous every time the music stopped, because I thought we were ready to restart. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, let me just share my screen and we can get going with the, uh, the presentation. Um, Okay, and let me just move this. Okay, so as uh, as uh, as Megan mentioned, we're uh, this is built uh, uh, around a paper that we uh, that I wrote with somebody you saw earlier today, Frederic Dimanche. Uh, it's a paper that we uh, published uh, recently, but that we really worked on last year. Uh, and it's a paper that's been published in the um, Journal of Tourism Futures um, earlier this year. So why were why did we get interested in in in, in the uh, what we called or what we coined for this paper we, uh, entertainment dependent destinations, right? So uh, obviously the, the, the implications are, relevant for cultural uh, tourism for other destinations in general, uh, albeit on a much uh, smaller scale. So what we what we call entertainment destinations are um, destinations that are overwhelmingly dependent on their entertainment sectors, right? So uh, we're looking at um, uh, destinations, and I said it here, uh, this, this kind of double whammy who had to deal with uh, at the same time, a disruption of the tourism and travel sector, as well as their, um, sorry, let me just get my, all right, as well as their uh, entertainment sector. And, and so while the, the COVID related closures were a rational move to contain the pandemic, the prevailing standards in those industries are kind of antithetical to social distancing. Uh, the, the magnitude of the measures impact was especially salient to moto industry destinations that rely heavily on their uh, entertainment sectors, in keeping in mind that many of those had just recovered from the 2008-2009 economic recession. And so as crowds became uh, danger zones, uh, the toll on cities such as uh, Vegas, Macau, New Orleans, but also on a smaller scale, vicinity, uh, uh, vicinities like Broadway, uh, London, West End, uh, Toronto's entertainment district. Um, so the impact has been nothing short of brutal. And just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here and some of the, you know, the people that we spoke to for this study here. So I mean, a place like Las Vegas, about 50% of their visitors normally arrive by air. Um, and, and, and so the, the statewide closure of all non-essential business, uh, including casinos, hotels, attractions, put over 300,000 jobs at risk uh, and pushed Nevada's employment rate above 20%. Uh, every month that the tourism is shut down uh, in uh, Nevada, you're looking at about $5 million US 
in economic loss. Uh, and again, same for Broadway. Uh, and again, most of this loss is uh, not just shouldered by the entertainment companies, but also and more generally by the nearby hotels, uh, the restaurants and the shops. Uh, and those are figures that, again, were also kind of consistent with what the what we saw in uh, other places. And again, I, I, I mentioned the case of Macau uh, during the 2008 crisis. Uh, and uh, at the time, entertainment was about 90% of the, the city's GDP. So that's why we, we mean by this mono uh, industry. So we were interested in understanding where those destinations go from there. And again, we are looking at this, this, this relationship between entertainment culture and, and tourism. And we have these destinations in which that relationship is very much intense. And so those become interesting to look at uh, and to draw implications for uh, uh, you know, destinations where perhaps that relationship is not as uh, intense. Now, typically uh, when we do uh, contingency or strategic planning, uh, we're, you know, organizations will generally table a few scenarios uh, along a, a best case, worst case spectrum. Uh, in, in, in what, what varies a lot and more importantly, what matters uh, immensely is the range of scenarios they explore, the data and sometimes the, the absence thereof, uh, they mobilize to build them, the time horizons they use, and the number of forces or factors and other than just industry related ones they consider uh, has having an impact on uh, these scenarios. So while they're you know, generally well-intentioned efforts, uh, we, find, we find that most organizations fail to fully explore the breadth, uh, the breadth of, of uh, possible futures, focusing instead on, on limited variations of a single outcome. Right, so will it take three years? Will it take three months? Uh, again, just looking at some of the, the poll results from, uh, from Megan, uh, I mean, in the sentence, first of all, the premise is that we're all, we're all assuming it's coming back. <laughs> uh, and again, the signs are there and we can, we can come back on that. So, but we're not challenging the idea that it's coming back and we're uh, really just exploring variations of a single outcome, which is it's coming back. Is it gonna be three weeks? Is it gonna be three months? Is it gonna be three years? Uh, other organizations just simply refuse to engage with this uh, exercise or to fully engage with this exercise uh, and, and, and refuse to consider more dramatic scenarios. Uh, and, and again, because they find, it, they find them to be a little bit too extreme or they fear what that might mean for their organizations. But the result is that we uh, end up with a lot of blind spots. And uh, you know, from a management standpoint, blind spots are threats. Uh, blind spots leave you vulnerable uh, or at the very least unable to fully pounce uh, on opportunities. Um, so, and the other thing about kind of this contingency strategic planning that we typically use uh, and that some of you are doing these exercises at the moment, most of them are, are using models or assumptions that typically uh, unfold along discrete stages uh, in a linear way and generally fail to account for the sort of iterative and all-encompassing in, all uh, disaster that we've uh, been in, uh, in in the last uh, year and a half. So, one of the premises of this uh, of this study, and one of the premises, in fact, of futures uh, future studies in general, is that there are no good or bad scenarios. Right? You're only looking at a range of possible futures, uh, and and whether they end up being good or bad, a lot of that depends on you and your preparation for these possible outcomes. Uh, and so understanding that there is no such thing as good or bad scenarios, but only a range of possible futures uh, forces us to uh, well, investigate what they, what they are uh, and to prepare for them. And, and, and more than that, I think you, it, it forces you to understand that you must learn how to succeed in whatever the real future might be, right? If you can thrive in a, a horribly pessimistic scenario, <laughs> right? 
uh, because the, those are the, 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 those are, you know, this is the hand you've been, you've been dealt with. Chances are you'll be fine in a slightly or, uh, or, you know, a lot more positive scenario, but you still have to prepare for the worst one. Uh, so we, uh, we, we use a, um, a, 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 a model or an approach to, to, this, uh, to this study here that we call, that's called the Manoa School of Future Studies, uh, which is really, um, a lot of it comes from the work of a, uh, a brilliant fellow uh, named Jim Dater, uh, who's at the uh, University of Hawaii in, uh, in, uh, in Manoa. And he looks at these uh, different forces, uh, he calls them the driving forces, technology, population, environment, eco economy, energy, culture, and governance. I mean, if you're, if you're doing, uh, again, if, you're, if you've been doing strategic planning, you, 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 know, you may have been working off the, the five forces or a pestle or uh, to some extent, it's a little bit more, it's, 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 it's kind of similar, but it's, it's different how you use uh, the, the approach. Uh, and so, I hear, you know, I, I heard the, the panelists just before the break talk about the trends, right? Some of the things that they're seeing uh, that they're paying attention to, and that's great. Um, and it's useful to see what might happen indeed if the trends were to continue. But sometimes it's more useful to consider what might happen when the trends might be interrupted or plateau or accelerate. And again, this is not something that we typically do or do really well. Uh, and the way to do this is generally a, you do this from a, uh, in, in a qualitative way, not quantitative. Um, so impact studies are great. Uh, you know, projections are great, but quantitative methods have their place. But given the unpredictability of the futures, uh, they're generally used as input into uh, rigorous and theory-based qualitative methods. Uh, such as the one that we used uh, in this particular study here. So when you when you collect data on the seven driving forces, you use them to uh, you, to, to to create the scenarios uh, of the four generic alternate uh, alternative futures. And again, we talk about the future a lot, and uh, you know the the, the 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 poll just before this uh, this presentation was about predicting when. Uh, the, the tourists will come back. Uh, it is not the purpose of future studies to predict the future. No one can. Um, in fact, little of importance in our world today can be predicted, right? Uh, but important parts of it can uh, and should be envisioned uh, and designed. And so um, what we did here is we collected, we collected information on all seven driving forces. And with that, we sketched for plausible, possible, and very different futures for life after COVID-19. And we presented them to our uh, to industry respondents. And when I say industry respondents, both um, uh, people from the tourism sector and uh, people from the entertainment sector uh, in uh, a range of uh, North American EDDs, entertainment dependent destinations, so anything from Nashville to Vegas to um, uh, New Orleans and Atlantic City. So those are the, the people that, that we presented our, our scenarios with uh, to. And we, you know, we did get a few laughs it, or we did get a few uh, reactions. Uh, and that's typically a good sign. That's typically a good sign that the future that you've come up with is, um, is different enough, is uncomfortable enough, is, uh, you know, presenting the respondents with, um, you know, alternatives that they may not have considered. And when you get to understand how those scenarios were, were built, uh, and then we, when you get to realize that none of those four generic futures were the product of our imagina imagination, but rather the results of weeks of, 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 of researching, uh, you, 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 you start to, to see how you can use them to, uh, to inform your, your decisions moving forward. Um, and I'll come back to this idea in, in a second. So I mentioned there are four generic futures. Um, 
the the, the first future, and I'll, I'll and I'll present them kind of in stride along with some of the results and the implications for uh, entertainment dependent destinations. The first one is is uh, coin continued growth. Uh, that's the official and preferred view of the future everywhere. Uh, so when we think about continued growth, uh, we're just seeing basically the pandemic, uh, albeit very long, right? Months, we didn't, I, I don't think any of us uh, thought it would be this long, but uh, it would have turned out to be kind of this uh, overall blip. And I'll, I'll mention this in a second. And I'm, I'm showing some, 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 uh, some images on this slide just to show you that those narratives around those futures are already around us, right? That all of the future, even though they're extremely different, you are kind of seeing signs and uh, discussions and you may, be, you, you may feel that this is where we're heading, right? So uh, those, are, those are all, uh, again, um, uh, normal considering that those are, you know, th this is what the scenarios are, are built on, right? So it's the show will go on and what this means for entertainment destinations, uh, for entertainment, uh, sorry, for uh, entertainment dependent destinations is that again, COVID-19 will turn out to be merely a blip in the overall uh, upward progress of entertainment tourism and humanity in general. Uh, and, you know, uh, such as, you know, 9-11, 2008, uh, 2008 financial crisis or SARS, um, sure it had an impact, but we, uh, we came out of it and we came out of it stronger uh, and bigger um, and we moved on, right? And so the same could be expected with COVID-19. Uh, and again, just in, this is something that we wrote last year. Uh, we were writing about scenario one in which, you know, the vaccine would be remarkably effective in eradicating the virus and life would return mostly to normal. Now, when discussing this with our respondents, uh, what we what we saw is that obviously some uh, you know sense of deja vu because you know they've gone through the the, the previous uh, crisis and disasters that I've mentioned uh, just now, uh, but they were quick to point out that you know the, the length and the scale and the magnitude of this crisis uh, left you know their sectors damaged, uh, and that that this was going to likely going to hinder a reboot right? The venues have closed or uh, have become, uh, you know, not quite up to new standards that have been developed in terms of, in terms of health and safety. Uh, staff is gone or staff needs to be retrained. Um, and when I say gone, I mean, some of them have just moved on, right? So it's completely new careers. Uh, and then also just having to deal with lingering fears, uh, kind of residual fears uh, or was I, would, I, would, I, would I allude to in the second point here about new sensitivities, right? So even though we, he, even though the show will go on, we would still have to uh, adapt to these uh, new behaviors that were developed, you know, during the pandemic, uh, and make sure that we have a response for the new sensitivities, or how people will still feel in a crowded uh, place. Uh, stiff competition as everything resumes all at once. Um, and again, just, just looking at, uh, you know, just from a, a destination standpoint or an entertainment provider right now, if you're, you know, if you're a promoter, you're looking at, uh, you know, everybody else, everybody else around you wanting to get back on tour and wanting to, you know, uh, reopen. So competition is, is, is something that is on their mind. And definitely, I mean, in terms of communication strategies, something about communicating about, again, being healthier than they are, um, than the others are, or at the very least kind of being able to reassure as being one of the next arms race for uh, entertainment desti uh, dependent destinations. Future number two is, uh, I mean, the generic future number two is called collapse. I'm um, sorry. And, and the collapse is, well, is our worst nightmares uh, and growing concerns. Um, so collapse looks at, uh, well, I mean, everything that we've seen also happening in recent years. Uh, we've, 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 we've known for a while about the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, we've seen a lot of social unrest. 
uh, we've seen, you know, energy supply and, and prices dynamics that are also at times very hard to predict, but will, would certainly have an impact on travel and entertainment. Uh, still unclear. I mean, the economy has is, 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 is kept up, but it, at the same time, it, it's unclear uh, of, you know, what might or what could happen uh, once the, uh, the government programs end. So, uh, you know, collapse, uh, future number two is, is actually quite negative. Um, again, it, when I say negative, there's a, there's this, you know, kind of a value judgment on it. It is one of the possible futures, right? Um, but again, the assumption is if you, basically, if you can make it in future two, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> Let's put it this way. So what it means for entertainment desti uh, dependent destinations, well, you know, think of, you know, pattern of, uh, it's kind of entering a, a pattern of constant virus mutation, waves and reoccurrence, um, uh, economic shocks and the glo uh, global output into a tailspin, non-essential expenditure uh, uh, comes to an halt. Uh, entertainment now the last of people's priorities. So nothing great, uh, again, for tourism and uh, entertainment. And when presenting this to, again, to the, to our industry respondents, um, interestingly, a lot of them were said, well, that's in a way what we've been dealing with for some time, right? And so the seeds of every future uh, seems uh, somewhat familiar to them, right? So there's also a sense of deja vu, or at the very least, they could see if those trends were to accelerate or continue or somehow converge, this sort of scenario uh, come together, right? So uh, already dealing with those problems before, uh, a lot of those destinations have been dealing with uh, issues around affordability, uh, acceptability from a community standpoint, artists struggling, uh, venues closing, um, so, it, you know, it, it's already kind of an ongoing challenge to maintain these uh, very fragile ecosystems. Uh, they would um, still, you know, try to focus on domestic, which is in a way what we've, we've been doing in the last uh, year and looks like we will still have to do this summer uh, so long as the, the borders uh, remain closed. So uh, focusing on domestic drive markets, uh, perhaps establishing safe corridors uh, between uh, certain destinations uh, or countries uh, and, and promote to those select markets. Uh, but the people that we would, um, that we would see in those destinations, and, and that's, not, that's not very consistent or very, very, very optimistic based on Frédéric's presentation earlier about uh, regenerative uh, tourism, is you know the the profile would change right so in a collapsed future uh, people traveling to those destinations would probably uh, be risk takers and bargain hunt hunters uh, in it for cheap trails right as opposed to the quality the sort of quality tourism that we would uh, hope for uh, interestingly none of them would see an end to um, there would still be a, a cultural scene an entertainment scene uh, albeit perhaps a little bit more bootleg or underground uh, people, but still people wanting to uh, consume uh, cultural offerings for sure. Uh, scenario number three or future number three, the generic uh, term is discipline. And, uh, and this is something, again, this is something that might sound uh, familiar to you or resonate with some of the things that you've been saying for years now uh, that we've been seeing for years in a way uh, but the idea is that, you know, smaller is beautiful or, you know, again, just making smarter choices uh, or being a little bit more mindful about the impact, uh, both, you know, quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, that we are um, uh, leaving behind and making. So by discipline, by people, you know, kind of wanting to do different or making different choices, uh, smaller choices, uh, thinking about prosperity without growth, right? Or redefining what prosperity means. Um, we've seen organizations do this, uh, you know, tourism and entertainment in, in, in recent months. Um, and we've also seen individual workers 
do this, right? So I've seen, uh, and you may have seen as well, a lot of uh, individuals in those sectors, people touring, people working in the arts and culture, um, reflecting, uh, questioning how they go about earning a living uh, and wanting to change, right? So, so you're looking at something that plateaus a little bit. So it's, it's, it's not so much just kind of resuming to growth, uh, but it's it's something that would that would be uh, very different. Again, prosperity without growth. What does that mean? How do we achieve it? Is is the idea behind uh, future number three? Uh, and as I say here, sustaining core values and avoiding collapse. So uh, you know, would the would the future look like the the scenario that we presented to our uh, respondents? Renewed attention on other threats. Uh, right. So we were dealing with. Uh, uh, a health uh, crisis, but at the same time, we are to be reminded um, that there were, you know, other threats, uh, and and that those just didn't stop. Uh, they're still around, and we have to address them as well. So, what about Earth's uh, availability uh, and limits of current business models or tourism models that we have that we've been working with? Uh, sustainability as a priority. People favor proximity over travel. Local offerings over international, and not just because the they have to, right? Not because the borders are closed, but because they want to. And that's the big difference, right? So assuming that people will want to travel when borders reopen, that's one scenario, but people might not want to, right? And so how do we, how do we cater to that? How do we respond to that? And how do we prepare for uh, that, that scenario as well, right? And that's the purpose of this uh, exercise here. Uh, mm -hmm. Under pressure, uh, organizations, destinations being under pressure, um, and you know the, the footprint uh, of these sectors uh, being uh, again under scrutiny and and being lowered immensely. So our respondents said, well, again, talks of mindful, restrained growth. Uh, all of this was happening before COVID. Uh, so in a way, again, it's nothing new, much like scenario one and scenario two or future one and future two is nothing new. Uh, strip down productions. Uh, there's an appeal for that and there's a market for that and there's a demand for that, right? And so not the, not so much these, uh, you know, glitzy productions and, and tours uh, or these companies or promoters touring with, you know, two full sets uh, of, uh, you, you know, uh, more, again, <laughs> having worked with, with Cirque du Soleil in, in recent years, you know, you know, coming, you know, going from city to city on routes that are not optimized at all for uh, the environment uh, and touring with, you know, 25 to 30 uh, 18 wheelers might not be the solution moving forward. Um, the contrary rise of what, you know, more like mindful or cost driven EDDs uh, such as uh, Branson, Missouri, uh, outdoor festivals, a little bit, a uh, little bit more um, simple uh, 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 cultural uh, offerings. Shift to cottage country, perhaps, right? So some of you were mentioning before the the fact that people moved out of the city. Uh, we've seen this in 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 many uh, large uh, North American cities. Uh, and so all of a sudden those cottage country or countryside are not just seasonal. Uh, uh, destinations, but perhaps become year long and there's, there's, there's enough people there and there's enough uh, diverse uh, uh, people in there to, to come up with, with offerings as well that could be interesting. So kind of shifting where we're going and what we're offering as well. And EDDs with, you know, a, a, an image uh, or a brand that uh, is a little bit more authentic, a little bit more local, uh, something like New Orleans, uh, definitely in a scenario like future three, having a lot more appeal um, than uh, say a Vegas or, you know, again, those, those destinations that uh, fit hardly with an image of sustainability. Do we just uh, and for, lastly, just sorry? a two minute warning, a two minute warning. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, 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 I might need five, but I'll, 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 I'll push through. Uh, future number four, transformation, bigger and meaner. Uh, so look, uh, you know, uh, future number four is not everyone has been sitting idle during the pandemic. Lots of companies have been, uh, you know, working on, you mentioned technologies, tools, lots of changes in terms of production of cultural goods, uh, but also 
how we go about consuming them. So are we preparing just for a reboot or are we preparing for also potentially something that might, that, that might be a lot bigger than it was before? Uh, and if we have capacity issues now, um, then certainly, and I'll, I'll skip ahead right now to implications, if we have capacity issues now or we're having that before or dealing with over tourism before, um, certainly that's gonna be an issue in case the trends that we're seeing not only just resume, but accelerate, right? So implications, not ready for pent up demand. Uh, it would take five to 10 years at, at the very least to come up with the infrastructure required for this. Uh, over tourism looming. Um, and so there were, <laughs> you know, some respondents were hoping that the actually government here would, would come up with, uh, you know, incentives not to spur demand, but actually to contain it to some extent. So I'll skip ahead to closing remarks. Uh, all the futures and you know, the respondents touched on uh, ongoing or growing concerns amongst EDDs, which are going to command attention regardless of this pandemic's outcome. Uh, we notice a general unpreparedness or lack of uh, solution uh, for you know, over tourism and uh, gentrification that either pushes out uh, or prices out locals from entertainment areas, changes in audience and towards the sensitivities and shifting power dynamics uh, in the uh, industry. Uh, and I will kind of urge you to keep on uh, looking around for these uh, four futures and to, to build and to prepare for them. And I want to use this quote here in 2009, right? I mean, nothing is too crazy. In 2009, this tourism scholar was writing it, and I'll, I'll just read it because it's beautiful. You read this today and you kind of, you have to smile. He wrote, it would be unwise <laughs> to imagine that tourism is going to decline sharply or even significantly in the short term future. It would take a, a combination of events or combined government and global actions to help tourism. Uh, that's 2009. Uh, and yet it, that's precisely what, uh, what ended up happening. Uh, and while there are certainly positive signs and reasons uh, to hope right now, uh, I want to urge uh, you to... Uh, uh, resist the tempta temptation to declare uh, victory too soon. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, or at the very least, we have to keep on preparing for all three futures. And it's the same in entertainment. You know, the signs are equally positive, but, you know, just seeing in this particular case here, Bruno Mars selling six shows in a, in a minute. But what happens, again, looking at trends, what happens when that, that trend stops? Right. So what happens when this catharsis moment that we're all kind of seeing or expecting when things reopen stops or plateaus or accelerate? So what do we do? Uh, and again, we, 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 the, the reality is we don't know. So let's not just plan for uh, reopening. Let's also keep in mind uh, that there might be a scenario two looming, a future number two looming, even though we don't want to see it. We're not comfortable with it and we'd rather just stick to future one uh, as uh, we've, we've had before. Any useful ideas about the futures should appear ridiculous. If you go back to your team, if you think about you know, the discussions uh, in the coming weeks, yes, future number two, it might appear ridiculous, it might appear crazy at this time, but it's also something that you should be preparing for. I'll leave it here because um, this, this, is, this is how I wanted to end this. Uh, and I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Um, that was great. When you started this talk, I was wondering what, what's a realistic scenario? And then I realized like, like how ridiculous is too ridiculous? And you've sort of answered me that nothing is too ridiculous. If my brain can go there, it's a possibility. Um, so unfortunately, we do, we do not have time for, for questions. Uh, we've got another speaker just ready to, to go right now. So we will be moving on to that, but I do see one or two in there and we'll be able to, to incorporate that into other opportunities or I can probably send them to, to Louis Chen and we'll be able to get Absolutely, those happy to answer them uh, afterwards. Uh, apologies for go going over time, uh, but, uh, but happy to answer any questions.